I am David A. Bradbury, and this is 20 Minute History. On today's episode, he is one of the pioneers of a landmark British civil rights bill, and yet the specifics of that bill, along with his stated motivation for passing it, leave activists understandably split on how exactly he should be remembered. For Leo Abse, a place in the history books is already guaranteed, but now it's up to us to decide what it says about him. This is Season 1, Episode 10. Let's jump right in. The Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 became British law when it gained royal assent on the 14th of August. Its primary goal was to alter certain existing legislations pertaining to sexual offenses, and it arguably contained a few laudable provisions, including one which raised the age of consent from 13 to 16, and others which guaranteed stronger protections against sex crimes for women and girls. But today... These clauses are largely overshadowed by the Act's infamous Section 11, also informally referred to as the La Boucher Amendment. The controversial passage proclaims in part, quote, any male person who, in public or private, commits any act of gross indecency with another male person shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. The terms here may be fairly vague, but from them, I'm sure you can nonetheless surmise that its purpose was to outlaw homosexual actions between men. At a cursory glance, you might regard this ordinance as nothing new in the history of English sexual regulations, and in a way, you would be correct. After all, an act of Parliament all the way back in 1533 guaranteed the death penalty for anyone who committed sodomy, or, as the letter of the law called it, quote, the detestable and abominable vice of buggery. No, I am not making that up. That is actually what they used to call it. Furthermore, this punishment would remain in place for more than 300 years until the Offenses Against the Person Act of 1861 downgraded that sentence to life imprisonment. An improvement, though not by much. So why pay specific attention to the La Boucher Amendment if it's just a seemingly milder entry in a centuries-old series? Well, because it's not actually as mild as it seems. The devil's in the details here, and specifically in the key difference between buggery and gross indecency. The punishment for sodomy may have been significantly harsher in theory, but in practice, a successful conviction required courts to prove that the subject had been penetrated. This ensured that, for the most part, prosecutions were fairly rare. The La Boucher Amendment, by contrast, drastically differed from previous laws in that it operated under what Dominic Jaynes describes as, quote, the legal assumption that any homosexual act was an attempt to commit sodomy. Since the state already considered male anal sex a serious threat to morality, it saw fit to illegalize any act which could potentially be a precursor to it, and it accomplished that goal by refusing to clarify the exact definition of gross indecency, thereby making prosecutable all non-platonic behaviors between two men, from fellatio to kissing to other public displays of affection. As a result, successful prosecutions for homosexuality skyrocketed, and punishments for these convictions ranged from a cruel two years imprisonment to the unimaginably vile act of chemical castration. Over the years, the British government turned countless men into examples of how a charge of gross indecency could ruin their lives. Without a doubt, Section 11 was horrifyingly effective at punishing homosexuals, but that wasn't actually its only purpose. It also aimed to prevent its spread, particularly to what society viewed as impressionable or corruptible young men. And in that respect, it failed miserably. I mean, of course it did. The fact that you can't just stop people from being gay by regulating them shouldn't be news to anyone listening. Nor is it surprising, I'm sure, to hear that the La Boucher Amendment really only succeeded in the sense that it created a culture of terror, with gay men constantly afraid that the arrests and police raids would soon come after them. 
But in spite of this reality, British lawmakers remained unmoved for a number of years, unable for whatever reason to admit the law wasn't working as intended. Perhaps they thought that only society's lowest, most depraved, most immoral individuals were at risk of feeling the law's wrath, and furthermore, that it was successfully deterring decent people from engaging in homosexual behaviors. Now, if this was their justification, then it likely began to crumble during the early 50s as some of Britain's most respectable men were forced into gross indecency trials, including the now famously tragic case of mathematician Alan Turing. And when the amendment took a swing at one of their own, their rationalizations shattered completely. Lord Montague of Beaulieu, a prominent legislator in the House of Lords, was found guilty of gross indecency in 1954. And though this wasn't necessarily enough to shake most people's conviction that homosexuality was a serious problem, it was enough to make government officials at least consider the idea that the law was inadequate. Public conversation surrounding homosexuals further increased in volume until August of that same year when the UK Home Office finally gave in to rising pressure by establishing the Departmental Committee on Homosexual Offenses and Prostitution. With Mr. John Wolfenden as its head, their official goal was simple, to examine the effects of the current statute and to then come forward with detailed suggestions for how it could potentially be revised. Over the next three years, the department pursued this objective tirelessly and fastidiously. And when their report was finally published in 1957, the conclusions contained therein were absolutely unprecedented. To be sure, some of the committee's proposals were definitely characteristic of 1950s homophobia. The Wolfenden Report did recommend that public gross indecency remain a crime, and also that the age of consent for homosexuals should be 21 when it was 16 for British heterosexuals. However, the committee's most consequential advice concerned those homosexual acts which occurred in private, the summary for which read, and I quote, Unless a deliberate attempt is to be made by society to equate the sphere of crime with that of sin, there must remain a realm of private morality and immorality which is not the law's business. Finally, for the first time in British history, a recognition that government should have nothing to do with things that went on in the bedroom between two consenting adults. Sure, for gay people, there were plenty of places to be reasonably critical, but it was still a significant step in the direction of permissiveness for homosexuals. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Or so you might think. In reality, Wolfenden was less the beginning of a new era of gay liberation and more, to borrow the words of a contemporary MP, a quote, staging post, end quote, which preceded an intense parliamentary battle just to secure that basic level of protection and respect. Indeed, as that same MP would recall in an interview, quote, when I entered the Commons after Wolfenden, the vote against it was overwhelming. That MP, in case you were wondering, was none other than the up-and-comer of the late 1950s Labour Party, Leopold Absey. In his childhood, Absey exhibited many characteristics which would later contribute to his reputation as a fiery, flamboyant, backbench politician. Growing up in Cardiff in the early 1920s, he had developed a fascination with public speaking by the age of six. He also inherited a very liberal worldview from his family, and in a curious incident of foreshadowing, he would become completely obsessed by the theories of Sigmund Freud, specifically those views concerning the natural state of human sexuality. As Absey would later recollect, he had, quote, been taught by Freud that men and women are bisexual. Moving swiftly through his early adulthood, Absey joined Cardiff's Labour Party in 1934, then served on the city's council for several years, then joined the Royal Air Force for the duration of World War II, and finally founded his own private legal firm in 1951. But all of this was, in many ways, nothing more than a precursor to the most significant chapter in Absey's life, his parliamentary career, which began with his election to become the Labour MP of Pontypool in 1958. And with debates over the Wolfenden recommendations still fresh on the House's mind, it is only natural 
that homosexual law reform would be the first major cause Abse would come to champion. Now, I should really pause here for a moment to clarify that I'm in no way saying that passing the Sexual Offenses Act was mostly, or at all, a one-man effort, nor was it largely just the effort of Parliament. In actuality, what transpired after the publication of the report was a 10-year war that consumed the energies of numerous different parties. Take for an example the Homosexual Law Reform Society, or HLRS, which worked behind the scenes throughout this entire decade and was absolutely instrumental in pressuring and advising lawmakers, as well as in holding public meetings to advance the cause of gay acceptance. And to its credit, it made great strides in the latter department. Public opinion started to change such that even though many folks still believed being gay was immoral, they nonetheless also believed that it should not be illegal. On the other hand, progress gained by their efforts on the legislative end was sadly limited as debates on the matter in 1958, 1960, and 1962 were all met with harsh backlash that killed the bills before they could even get started. Looking at this succession of failures, campaigners knew that they had a rough road ahead of them. But then in 1964, they witnessed a small glimmer of hope. For Parliament, it was out with the old, in with the new with the reform-minded Labour Party securing a marginal victory. Encouraged, the HLRS, along with similar organizations, geared up for the fight of their lives, revamping their information campaigns and strengthening their alliances in government. And this time, their endeavors in Parliament were paying off. More and more MPs were expressing support for reform, and there were even a few bold men and women that were beginning to stand up, ready to prove themselves capable of leading the charge. Leo Abse was determined to be one of them. We'll be right back. History is a fascinating field that is unfortunately massive on a scale that beggars comprehension and is not always easily accessible, especially when we're talking about the complex issues of human rights abuses and government oppression that surround genocides. Here at Genistory, we agreed to do this. We aim to change that. Join me on the 15th of every month as we take a comprehensive overview of the field of genocide studies, the various genocides throughout history, and the representation of genocide in fictional media. Together, we're going to help ensure that never again is more than just a slogan. You can find Genistory wherever you find podcasts. Uh, that's not kind of productions podcast. The bill drafted by Parliament in 1965 to legalize, quote, homosexual acts in private would endure quite the slog before finally becoming law. It started out very much looking like the Wolf End in recommendations, but by the time it had passed through the House of Lords, been shot down by the Commons, and returned to the Lords only to endure grueling consideration of almost two dozen amendments, it started to look substantially different. For example, the definitions of in private provided by the 1957 report and by Parliament were not at all the same. Whereas the former believed it to mean acts which were not committed in public, the latter thought it should only refer to acts carried out where no one could bear witness to them besides the participants. Meaning kissing your partner at home with other people around was theoretically still illegal. And that's just one of several different sections where legislators removed, altered, or watered down mandates for the sake of political expedience. But all that notwithstanding, the bill finally passed the Lords and made it to the Commons, where it died because that session of Parliament ended. But no matter, the groundwork was laid for Lord Arryn to reintroduce it in 1966 when it would be fast-tracked back to the Commons in less than a month. Now... With the historical spotlight focused squarely on him, Abse took the stage and got to work. The first three readings breezed by, and despite some reasonable reservations about the bill as it passed through committee, it ultimately survived that stage as well. All the while, Abse remained resolute in his reasoning. The current laws were unenforceable and unfair, and it was time to change them. 
His toughest test would then come in the conclusion of the report stage, when Abse would circumvent any further filibusters on amendments by holding a marathon final session to ensure the bill's closure. All through the night he worked until at 5.50 a.m., the bill passed, all but guaranteeing its royal assent. It was a massive victory for homosexuals. It was a great day for Britons. It was the highlight of Mr. Abse's career, and it was the... You know what? No. No, 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 no. Okay, please, just stop the music, please. Stop. Stop, please. Ugh, look, much as I'd love to continue with this uplifting rhetoric, it just feels too disingenuous for a multitude of reasons. Not the least of which being, shocker, that gay people really didn't like it all that much. And fair enough, we're describing an amendment to the law which maintained that any public homosexual act, as well as those which were carried out between, say, a 21 and a 20-year-old, would still be illegal. Forget the fact that it looked nothing like the progress that we'd expect today. Even back in the 1960s, activists like Antony Gray were upset over its provisions. And worse yet, for all the dissatisfaction gay people felt over the specifics of the new law, the statements Mr. Abse delivered in the debates over it gave them even more reason to groan. To hear Mr. Gray tell it, Abse was far too willing to offer compromises to social conservatives, too willing, as he puts it, to placate the implacable. And he's got a point. In addition to weakening many of Wolfenden's suggestions in the actual bill, Abse publicly said in 1966 that the law's foremost purpose was not allowing homosexuals a greater degree of freedom, but rather, quote, preventing little boys from growing up to be adult homosexuals. And there's a wealth of other statements just like this one. In fairness, Abse would later claim that he knew this reasoning to be a load of hogwash and that he had very good reasons for making the compromises he did. After all, the act did come uncomfortably close to not passing the Commons. At the end of the day, though, I find it hard to blame gay people and allies for being less than thrilled about Abse's statements, about his writings, about his alleged motivations, and especially about his tactics in getting his bill passed. Bottom line, the Sexual Offenses Act of 1967 as progress was late, labored, and incomplete. But it was, fundamentally, progress. Allow me to be clear, I don't intend to dictate to anyone how they should or shouldn't feel, but personally, throughout all the historical excursions on which I've embarked, one consistent thread I've noticed is that progress very rarely looks the way we'd all like it to. The 1964 Civil Rights Act wasn't perfect. The abolition of slavery as a process was far from perfect, and decolonization as a process was often so messy as to be legitimately harmful. But still, we can easily recognize that they were improvements upon the systems that preceded them, and we make that the primary factor in consideration of their worth. As it should be, I propose, with Leo Abse and the Sexual Offenses Act. Elevating the man to hero status would certainly be misinformed, but failing to recognize the good he did because of his imperfections would be just as unhelpful. To end this story, I will simply say that Abse's time in Parliament drew to a close in 1987, and by that time he had helped pioneer liberalization efforts in the areas of divorce, abortion, and many more. His nomination to the House of Lords was later blocked by Margaret Thatcher, after which he spent decades writing a number of books centered around psychoanalysis. Then, in 2008, at the age of 91, he died. And as a final note, I find it fitting that before he closed his eyes for good, he got to watch as Parliament passed the Sexual Offenses Act of 2003 which repealed and improved upon his own law. So to all the activists out there, our goals may take a while, but they are achievable. Roll up your sleeves. We've got work to do.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode and this season of 20 Minute History. As always, if you liked it, then please consider subscribing to the podcast, leaving a rating, and following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 20MIN History. Research for this episode relied heavily upon the works of Anthony Gray, Jeffrey Goodman, Geraldine Bettle, James Treadwell, Adam Lines, and Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite. We'll be on break for the next few months to prepare for season two, but don't worry, we'll be releasing several bonus episodes between now and then, so keep your eyes peeled for those. But until then, I've been David A. Bradbury, and please stay curious, keep reading, and above all, take care of yourselves. Oh, and happy holidays. Happy holidays.